Okay, hi everyone. My name is Sandor Takela and I'm a postdoc at the Center for Astrophysics. In the next 10 minutes, I will give you a short overview of some of the recent research I've been doing on quenching massive galaxies around Redshift of One. In the past three decades, it has become clear that galaxy growth needs to be regulated. Specifically, star formation needs to be suppressed or quenched at high masses. This quenching solves two problems. First, quenching ensures the buildup of the quiescent sequence and that more massive galaxies host older stellar populations. Second, it can explain why the galaxy's stellar mass function is different from the dark matter halo mass function, in particular at high masses. The most recent generation of theoretical models, such as Illustris TNG, Simba, and Eagle, are all able to reproduce the buildup of the quiescent sequence with cosmic time. This is partially by construction, since these simulations have been optimized to reproduce key observations, such as the galaxy stellar mass function and the cosmic star formation rate density. Clearly, we want to learn more about quenching in the phases of quenching, and we need to go beyond simple number densities. I will make the case in my talk now that the timescale for quenching and also how quenching proceeds within galaxies on space resolved scales will help us uh, to learn more about galaxy quenching. I show you here three predictions from different numerical codes. On the left, you can see Nostris TNG. In the middle, you can see Simba. And on the right, you can see Eagle. And so in my talk, I will try to show you how we can learn more about the quenching times for distribution in the galaxy population. First, I want to focus on the galaxy stellar mass function, which you can see at the bottom right of this panel. Here you can see the galaxy stellar mass function evolves from redshift 2 to redshift 1. At early times, we see that the galaxy mass function is really dominated by star forming galaxies. And around redshift 1, however, we can see that the massive end is already dominated by quiescent galaxies. And so there are a lot of galaxies that quench or transition um, around redshift of 2 to redshift 1. Then when we go to lower redshift, we can see that the high mass end is still evolving, but there is a significant increase in quiescent galaxies at low masses, which is probably because of environmental effects, such as satellite quench. Now, in my talk, I want to focus around the redshift of 1 and 2, because that's where most of the central galaxies are quenched. Looking at number density evolution of star forming and quiescent galaxies, one can study how quickly galaxies need to transition through the Green Valley on typical, on average timescales. You can see that in Pandya et al.'s work, the galaxies quench quite rapidly at early times, on the order of a few giga years, and then at later times, galaxies take much longer to transition through the Green Valley. Now, looking at space resolved scales, we can actually look at star formation quenching in star forming galaxies that are at the verge of quenching. We have been doing this on space resolved scales by combining Hubble Space Telescope imaging to you know, constrain the stellar mass on, on space resolved scales and VLP Symphony to map out with the H alpha emission line the star formation distribution in these galaxies. And we found that these galaxies host already mature bulges in their central cores while the star formation takes place in a rapidly rotating disk. In addition, when we compare the cell mass distribution of these galaxies around redshift of two with the galaxies at later epochs, we found that these galaxies quench the star formation from the inside out on timescales of a few hundred million years. With the same observational data, we were able to find signatures of powerful nuclear outflows in the course of these galaxies, which might point to an activity um, related to the black hole that suppresses the star formation in the central cores of these galaxies. In the reminder of my talk, I want to use the archaeological approach to measure star formation histories and quenching timescales in quiescent galaxies around redshift of 1. We want to do this around redshift 1 and not today because we want to be as close as possible to the epoch of quenching in order to ensure that the stellar populations contain the necessary information to constrain the quenching timescale. We have been doing this as part of the HALO 7D survey. Um, the HALO 7D survey provides very deep spectra for quiescent galaxies around redshift of one. The main purpose of this survey is actually looking at the Milky Way HALO, uh, but we have been using basically the same, um, this, you know, the same observations to track the background galaxies that lie in the candles fields, which ensures that we have multi-wavelength data for these objects. On the right, you can see that we have roughly 160 galaxies, in particular at high masses, both star-forming quiescent galaxies around redshift of about one. 
I've been using Prospector, which is a sophisticated SED fitting code um, to, uh, to basically fit both photometry and spectroscopy at the same time. This is um, a fully patient framework, which allows us to really study the full covariances between different SED parameters. I don't want to go into too, too much details of all the parameters, but we are basically fitting an advanced physical models with about 27 parameters. I want to stress that we're using a non-parametric star formation history, which allows us to fit a diverse, um, that diverse star formation histories in 10 non-parametric bins. Of course, the priors are very important, something that I don't have really time to touch on, but I'm happy to discuss further um, in the future with you on slide. I'll show you here the resulting fit for one of our example galaxies. You can see here, this is a galaxy around Rajiv 4.9. You can see up on the top left the photometry, which is well fit by the red line, which is our model. And on the bottom, I'll show you the spectrum. You can see that the photometry really extends to full wavelength range, all from the UV to the medium infrared, while the spectra really covers basically the, the, the optical part. On the right, you can see the resulting posterior distribution for the metallicity, the cellar mass, the specific star formation in dust, and the age. Important on the top right, you can see the star formation history. So this galaxy had an increased star formation history at early times, was plateauing about one to three giga years ago, and then was declining quite rapidly in the last giga year. Now, what we can do is we can look at the average star formation histories for massive galaxies around redshift of one. So first, you can look at the blue line, which shows you the star forming galaxies. You can see that we are able to reproduce direct measurements of the star formation at cellar mass relation also at earlier cosmic times. So you see the blue line basically tracks the specific star formation rate measurements um, of, of, the, of you know, direct measurements at early cosmic times, which shows that our measurements are not a world too crazy. Going at early cosmic times, we can see that the star formation histories between the star forming quiescent galaxies is similar. And then the quiescent galaxies have typically decoupled from the star forming main sequence around redshift two to three. Another thing to highlight is that the star formation history of star forming galaxies follows the one of the specific um, accretion rate of the dark, dark matter halos. Now, we don't wanna just stack the data, we actually have you know, the information for each individual galaxy. And I show you here now the star formation histories for the quiescent galaxies. Again, you can see that the specific star formation rate at early times are all very high. So basically all the quiescent galaxies at the epoch of observations um, have been star forming at earlier times. They have been transitioning now over a wide range of different timescales, right? Some galaxies transition quite quickly, where some other galaxies are transitioning very slowly. Furthermore, you can see that galaxies transition um, over a wide range of epochs. Some galaxies quench very early on, while some other galaxies quench quite late. This is also the key message I want you to show in, in this presentation. We can look at this also in this parameter space, where I show you the quenching timescales in giga years as a function of the quenching epoch which is you know, the redshift when galaxies quench. And again, you can see that our galaxies basically span a wide range in both redshift and quenching timescales. Now, in order to compare this to the theoretical models, I've been looking into illustrious TNG. For this work, I've been projecting the theoretical coordinates into the observational space, meaning I've been mocking up each individual galaxy in a simulation um, and basically predicted the photometry and the spectroscopy and then refitted uh, with the same um, approach as with our observational data, the theoretical uh, spectra and photometry. And so you can see that the distribution overall shows basically the same median roughly around galaxies quench on typically a giga year time scale and they quench mainly between redshift one and two. However, we don't find galaxies that quench very early on in illustrious TNG or they quenched very slowly. Now I will make the case that this is um, partially because um, the simulations might not be able to reproduce this wide quenching times for distribution because they are assuming a too simple quenching, um, a too simple quenching uh, model. And so we put forward that the, the observations are basically telling us we want to have a combination of internal and external quenching mechanisms. And I want to show you basically a simple intuitive picture that we put forward back in 2016. So I'll show you here the distribution um, of the galaxies around the star forming main sequence as a function of mass. I show you here on the halo mass, and we can see that galaxies around 10 to the 12 are probably in a hot halo where the gas accretion onto the galaxies is suppressed. 
Now, galaxies are believed to be oscillating around the star forming in sequence equilibrium, and then they're quenching on a wide range of different time scales. How can we achieve this? So, first, when galaxies are basically having this, what we call typically a star forming compaction, or you know, where they consume all the gas, these galaxies are basically having close to zero gas content when they're on the top of the star forming main sequence. And then what they want is basically suppress and quench the star formation. In the case where the old gas is consumed while the galaxy is in a hot halo, we see that the gas cannot be really replenished, right? The replenishment time scale is much longer than the depletion time scale, and this galaxy will quench very rapidly. On the other hand, we have a slowly quenching galaxy in the case where the older gas is consumed uh, before the halo mass threshold is reached. And so the, the replenishment time scale is shorter than the depletion time, and the galaxy is able to re accrete some gas and basically quench rather slowly. And so you can see that in this case, a dark matter halo acts as a gatekeeper where the internal process, maybe a black hole or stellar feedback, acts as an agent for quenching the galaxy. So in summary, I showed you the galaxies at early times quench inside out. This might be related to a black hole feedback that quenches the galaxy from the centers to the outskirts. And then at later times, when we look at star at quiescent galaxies around redshift one, I showed you a large diversity of quenching timescales and deep which points towards a combination of internal and external quenching mechanisms. Now, of course, there's plenty of time to still introduce a large, the, the bimodality that we can see in the quiescent population between fast and slow rotators. Now, I'm very excited about the future when it comes to further you know, measure more quenching time scales for a larger sample of galaxies. So I think it's very important to really time how quickly galaxies transition through the Green Valley and then also do more careful comparisons between observations and theoretical models. And here again, I think we have to do the comparison in the observational space by projecting the theoretical quantities into the, th into the observational space. Finally, I'm very excited about future instrumentation such as the James Webb Space Telescope to measure the formation of the first class in galaxies, as well as the ELT to really track the quenching on spatial resource scales. Thank you very much for your attention.